it's called Updating Contraception Menopause, and I think I'm going to start with contraception and do um, the first 20, 25 minutes and then move over to menopause and some hormone therapy. And I'm really happy to have questions during the presentation or after, whichever is easiest, but you might need to shout at me so I don't miss that you want to ask me a question. I've been asked to say that I'm hosting a table or sitting at a table at lunch if anybody wants to join me. And just to say, I haven't got any conflict of interest. And I guess we're still really pushing. You'll notice with this whole contraceptive talk that apart from JDES, which we'll talk about in a minute or two, there isn't really a lot of very new stuff in the last year. But there's this very, very big push, and you'll hear it from everyone, for long-acting reversible contraceptives. And we're talking about IUDs and implants. And there's a big push for that because, as you can see, they are... Um, the number one contraceptive method above um, injectables and pills and everything else. And they're number one because of their use continuation. Their use continuation at a year is around um, 80%. And I think we've really shown how effective they are in various studies in New Zealand. Um, this is one we did at Epsom Day Unit some years ago, three-year follow-up period. Um, women who left with an IUD immediately post-termination were 70% less likely to come back for a repeat abortion um, in the following year than those who left with other methods such as the pill or even Depo-Provera. And then shortly after that, of course, the uh, operating surgeons will insert the IUDs, but when LARTs became... Um, the really in thing to be thinking about when implants became funded. Um, the, we've re we realized that we needed to um, train our nurses at Epsom Day Unit. So after the termination in recovery, a woman who wanted JDL can have that inserted for free as part of the service uh, before they go home. And we started training the nurses, I think the first nurse I trained was 2011, and we now have over 3,000 implants inserted at Epsom Day Unit by the nursing staff. And this um, nice study by Sally Rose uh, from Otago showed exactly the same things with implants. So a 74% reduction in subsequent abortion over the next four years compared to those um, using a pill or Depo-Provera. So a very strong message coming through. And not just post-termination. Um, um, we can actually see here, this is a study from Colorado, immediate insertion of implants. We talk immediate insertion after delivery. So not waiting to six weeks or later, um, you will have five less... Um, five times less risk of a pregnancy from those, for those women um, who had it immediately inserted than the controls who were waiting for six weeks or um, even later. So really strong messages coming, let's get contraception started immediately after termination and after delivery. And you know, you probably all know these, they're exactly the same as WHO criteria, one, two, three, four, one's unrestricted, unrestricted use and four is do not use. And you can see very clearly that putting in an IUD immediately post-delivery um, is a really good thing to do. And we're going to be having a RANSCOG talk throughout New Zealand, a uh, first talk starting in April, when we're really going to be sp supporting um, clinicians to be putting in IUDs immediately post-placental. Um, you can also see that um, progestion-only contraceptives can be started immediately, and I'll show you a systematic review that shows that they don't affect breastfeeding. But you can see that this has not changed. The combined pill, you're not going to start that immediately because of the increased risk of VTE in the first three weeks after pregnancy. And obviously, um, if the woman's breastfeeding, that it may affect the milk supply. But no problem with progestion-only methods and the milk supply. And this is just uh, saying exactly the same things. This comes from the Faculty of Family Planning and Reproductive Health website, and we'll be showing you the URL for that in a minute or two. But you can see that everything's one or two, um, less than six weeks postpartum. And this is the systematic review that clearly gave us the messages, strong messages, that we're going to be taking around New Zealand to clinicians, to midwives, to GPs, that um, contraception and progestion-only methods can be started straight away, even if a woman is breastfeeding, and that includes implants and depo. And this is really a kind of a difficult slide for me to talk about, as I have to say. This is Jane McDonald's, some recent work. And these are women who... Um, who had severe 
maternal morb morbidity. And this was throughout four different DHBs in New Zealand. And it's very hard to remember that 86% of these women who really should not be getting pregnant again or for a long time left without a contraceptive method. Um, in summary, these results indicate substandard care. This is what the authors actually thought. And they're really pushing for DHBs to have midwives or nurses who are really there dedicated to make sure women leave with a contraceptive method, who are there to teach the SHOs how to put JDELs in, um, etc., etc. So we have a long way to go when this sort of thing is happening um, in our own country. So here we are, here's the website we were talking about. The important thing, of course, is to give women evidence-based information. We don't want to be giving um, information that is not from randomized placebo-controlled studies. Um, and so here's some information here about injectables. There is no evidence that they cause mood change or a change in libido or headaches. And you can, if you have a look at the family planning pamphlets, you will see that any of the information that's there now is evidence-based. We don't say, oh, the pill may cause weight, because the RCTs that we do have with the pill shows it clearly doesn't um, cause weight. So we're trying to actually give women the correct information. But the main thing I think we need to talk to women about with implants is, of course, that one out of seven women will actually get bleeding in between, in between their periods. 20% will have no periods, but this uh, nuisance bleeding can be a bother for them. The most important thing to say to women is, come back early if you've got this. You don't need to put up with it. We will give you a contraceptive pill on top of it, and that will help the bleeding out, hopefully. Because there's a window of opportunity, really, with implants. Women who are sent away, you know, it may get better by itself, get to the stage where they just get completely fed up and want it taken out. Whereas if they'd been given the pill, um, they may well have held onto it and had an improved bleeding pattern. And indeed, there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't use JDL and have the pill on top uh, for as long as you like to make your bleeding pattern better. Um, and it's very interesting, the number of women who were not very good at remembering the pill for contraception, but are now very good at remembering it because it means their bleeding pattern's better with JDL. So this is really what we've been talking about. We're using the pill on top, uh, and um, you want to start doing that early so that women don't um, give up their method of contraception. So some more evidence-based things about implants. There's no uh, evidence for weight change, mood change, or um, change in libido, um, or headaches. Um, acne may stay the same or improve, or there's not really a lot of data to say that it's going to make cause acne or make your acne worse. And also, we're now happy that women with a high BMI can leave their implant in for the whole five years. There was some talk years and years ago that maybe at four years you should take it out, but in the fifth year, the failure rate may increase slightly, but it's still 1%, which is pretty good. So really the messages, I guess, from the research really are um, that we give good um, information about real evidence-based side effects. We don't say to women, this might happen and that might happen unless it's based on good studies. And we want to look at very early um, initiation of contraception after abortion um, and after delivery. So this is the website that we've been getting all this stuff from. And this is so easy for you to keep on your favorites. And you can click into it and you can get the guidance on all methods of contraception. It will come straight up for you. And also the UK medical eligibility criteria that we've been showing you. You can find out um, answers very, very quickly at, um, at, your, um, at your desk. These are not particularly new things, but they're kind of newish things just to point out from the website. You can see here there is a little bit of change with BMIs, so that over um, 35, the pill really now is becoming a three. Um, over 39, of course, it's a four. Um, here we are looking at headaches. This has changed. You can see that if you actually are using the pill, I's for initiation, C's for continuation, if you're actually using a pill and you get your first migraine without aura on the pill, continuation with the combined pill is now a three. 
So that has, that's probably a bit of a change for you. We always knew that migraine with aura is a four for the combined pill, but um, this is um, somewhat newer. Um, I think this has been like this for many, many years, um, so we don't really need to wait to beat HCGs or back to normal to initiate hormonal contraception um, after, a, after trophoblastic disease. And this has been around for a very long time, but still seems to be a bit of a problem with people. Previous PID, you have no problem with using uh, a, an IUD. Obviously, current PID, you should treat it before you should put your IUD in. If you have an IUD in and you get a chlamydia infection, you just treat it. Um, you don't need to take your IUD out. Um, I think it's probably been like that for, I don't know, six or seven years now. And this happened a few years ago, but a lot of women don't seem to get this information still, that antibiotics do not interfere with a combined pill. Uh, we've got enough data now to clearly say that. I often get uh, lots of questions sent to me on emails. I'm really happy to get the questions and answer them on, on email. But just, you know, this website's really good for answering things. So you can see this is a website. This little search engine up at the top here is really useful. And you can type in stuff. So let me give you an example. If you have somebody who's had a history of benign intracranial hypertension, you can type that in there. And up will pop um, an answer from the clinical effectiveness unit. And sometimes that's going to be helpful, because here it says, um, we know we can't use a combined pill with that, but there have been case reports with progestion-only implants. Um, the CEU would suggest liaising with pa patient urologists. But hey, this is saying this woman can use a copper IUD. So you immediately might be able to give her a method of contraception that isn't contraindicated in her case before you refer her to anybody else. These are very old rules, but just reminding you, combined pill. When do we have to worry? We have to worry when you've missed two pills. So it's 24 hours late with the pill, i.e. it's 48 hours since you took your last pill. I okay, still hear people talking about 12-hour leeways and so on. Combined pill, that's changed. You can miss one pill, but once you've missed two pills and you've had sex, then you need to look at having the emergency contraceptive pill um, or the post-coital IUD. And of course, it's seven hormone pills until you're covered. Sarah Z is like the old combined pill rules. So if you're 12 hours late with your pill, i.e. 36 hours since you took your last pill, you need to wait for either seven days of hormones so you get back your anti-ovulatory effect of Sarah Z, or if you just want to wait to get back to your cervical mucus effect, um, you can wait for two days. Noraday hasn't changed, the low-dose POP hasn't changed. Three hours late with the pill, 27 hours since you last took it, you need to take um, two pills in a row until you're covered get your cervical mucus effect back on again. Of course, with all those rules, it's so much easier to take, if you're using the combined pill, we're teaching this a lot, particularly at Epsom Day Unit, take your hormones continuously. Who wants to have a break? Who wants to have a withdrawal bleed, the period? And if you take your hormones continuously, and you can do that for as many years as you like, because that endometrium you're building up just sits there, it doesn't get thicker or anything, it's just sitting there until you stop your pill and want to withdraw a bleed. But the great thing about this is you get much better contraceptive efficacy, so we have good studies showing us that, and of course you'd have to miss um, over eight pills in a row to get pregnant, and um, even for those of us who are forgetful, that would be a wee bit hard. So continuous hormones is a way to teach the pill, and it's so easy to teach because you just keep going, you don't take your placebos. Reiterating what's been around again for a long time, IUDs do not cause infection. IUDs can be used by, for ad, by adolescents. Um, the same information applies. If you're changing partners, you need to use condoms until you, they've had an STI to check. But there's no reason for an oliparous woman or adolescent woman uh, that they shouldn't be able to use an IUD quite successfully. So we're not, we've changed, and when I was working with family planning, this changed a couple of few years ago. We're not doing routine swabs for women who are in a stable relationship. 
Uh, if you have BV, you don't need to treat it before you put an IUD in. You don't ha need to have a period if you've not had unprotected intercourse since your last period to put an IUD in. Condoms are considered as a good um, contraception to have used since your last period. Um, if you have had unprotected intercourse, you can use your IUD, your copper IUD as a post device um, within five days of possible ovulation. If you're putting in a postcoital IUD and you're unsure about that woman, if she's perhaps had um, multiple partners, maybe at risk of picking up an STI, do the swabs, but you can treat with azithromycin at the time. Always do a PV if you're putting an IUD in. Always put the tenaculum on. Always sound the uterus. Um, and occasionally, if you have a tight off and need dilation, paracervical block is really easy to put in and really nice to use for some adolescents. Really important to talk about the first few periods might be heavier, Ponstan is useful, and of course to discuss that you may get some irregular bleeding the first few months with Mirena. We know, we've said this before, but if you have um, chlamydia at the time, treat it and put the IUD in. Um, if the IUD is in and you pick up chlamydia, just treat the chlamydia and leave the IUD in. And there's some extended time frames now coming through with the research. Uh, not everyone has agreed that they're happy with this systematic review, but basically the TT380A, which is a 10-year device, can actually stay in for 12 years. The Morena looks as if it's going to be fine for seven years. These are outside license, but I really, I guess really what I'm saying to you, if somebody comes to you and they have a copper T380 in and it's 10 years, there isn't any rush to take it out. The number of women at Epsom Day Unit we see whose IUD or Marena has been taken out because it was five years put in or 10 years put in and left with no method of contraception are now pregnant. There's no hurry um, if you don't insert IUDs yourself. Let them leave it in and um, they can wait you know, up to another year or something and see somebody who can um, take the old one out and put another one in for them. J. Des, I guess, is a little bit newer, so it's the small Morena. Um, it's slightly shorter, it's slightly narrower. It has less hormone in the stem, less levonorgestrel in the stem, and it's really just indicated for contraception, not for heavy menstrual bleeding or endometrial protection in HRT. Though indeed there, are, there is some work with a um, IUS with even less levonorgestrel in it showing good endometrial protection. So that may well come as an indication for JDES later on. It's a really lovely little device, you know, and it is, I'll have to say, a lot easier to put in with those women who, have a, who are young, who have a very, very tight cervix. Um, Interestingly enough, it wasn't really indicated or marketed for adolescents because there wasn't a lot of work on it um, when it came onto the market. But we now have a new study that's in press showing that in adolescents uh, it was easy insertion, 11% um, said there was some pain, so that it might be useful for these women to have a paracervical, no pregnancies at the end of year one, 83% continuation rate. So really an appropriate uh, method for adolescents to use. It's not funded for contraception, and it's to mid-200s um, in cost, and it's three years. Okay, I think we've done that bit. And just to finish up with, um, and I'm sure you've mostly caught up with this, but this is a study with Anna Glacier in um, Scotland. And for women with high BMI, um, over 25, the ECP doesn't really seem to work for these women. So you really need to be thinking of offering uh, an intrauterine device um, to get a good effective post method for women with a higher BMI. And of course, as a post method, it can be put in um, up to 120 hours of the first episode of unprotected sexual intercourse or within five days of the earliest expected ovulation. And that's so that you're putting in before that fertilized egg that does a seven-day journey back into the uterus has got to the uterus and your IUD is there already to stop implantation occurring. Okay, so that's a quick scoot through um, contraception. Do you want to have some questions now or will I move on to menopause? I take it that I'll move on to menopause? Or is there one done yet? Okay, okay so there's a mic coming your way. It's just
just a quick question. Um, the BMI of 25 or over, that would be a lot of our patients. Um, has that just changed recently? Because I thought it was 30. Um, no, the, the actual study showed that over 25, um, it was not going to be very useful <clears throat> to use the emergency contraceptive pill. That's, what the, that's directly from the paper. Um, you may have chosen, or somebody may have chosen to, to move that up a bit, but that's what the data showed. Hmm. Anybody else? Yeah, just got um, one question. Migraine with aura, if you could just define aura. So where, sorry, where are you? Oh, yeah. yep, sorry, thank you. Yeah. Yep. Um, so migraine with aura. So some Good question. Um, twinkly lights, field loss, yeah. Yeah, yeah and I think that's really um, one of the things that's often done. You really have to get a good history. So basically, one migraine is a unilateral headache, for starters. Two, if you're looking for the visual symptoms, we don't worry about flashing lights or fortification spectrum. It is loss of field of vision, scotoma, homonymous hemianopia that you're asking for. So you'll often find a lot of young women have been told, oh, I have migraine with aura, and all they had was lights hurt their eyes or they got some flashing lights. They didn't have migraine with aura. The two other aura thingamajiggies are loss of power on one side of the body or um, change in sensation or tingling up and down one side of the body. But it's the visual ones that people often don't get quite right. Mm. Okay, so there's something called overring. Hello? Yes? Local uh, contraception overring or something they insert in the vagina. Similar to contraceptive pills. Oh, so you're talking about the Nova Ring? Yes, that's been out for quite a few years. Um, it's still kind of tier two because um, women may, so it's combined hormonal ring, leave in for three weeks, take out for one week if you want to have your withdrawal bleed. Um, it's fairly expensive. It's going to be 30, 35 for one month's supply. Um, it's still tier two because women can often forget to take it out when it's been in a few weeks and forget to put the new one in. But yeah, the Nova Ring has been in New Zealand for what, three, four, five years or something. Yeah. Okay, shall I move on then? All right, um, so just moving on to menopause so. Um, and this is very easy. The indications for hormone therapy, which I'm going to talk about initially and then we'll talk about some other modalities for treatment in a minute or two, um, but they haven't changed. So hot flushes, night sweats, vasomotor symptoms, genital urinary symptoms, which is now seems to have a new blanket term called genital urinary syndrome. And you know, some of the new longitudinal data is showing us that um, hot flushes and night sweats may last for longer than we uh, thought, so that the average, average duration may be around about seven years. And of course, so there's these women, which I think clinically for all of us is a little bit difficult, who go on having hot flushes for a very long period of time. They stop their hormone therapy to see if their flushes have gone, their flushes haven't gone, they go back on again and they stop it. And we'll be talking specifically about those women, those older women who cannot seem to get off their hormone therapy, who really still have debilitating flushes. And I guess the night sweats are the thing that are most debilitating for them because they can't sleep. But there are modalities of hormone therapy which are a little bit safer for those women to use. Genital urinary syndrome, so we're talking about dry vaginas, pain with intercourse, recurrent urinary tract infections, urge symptoms, urinary um, urge incontinence, all of those things are, are the genital urinary syndrome. 50% of women seem to get those. Why that group get them and then the other group don't get them, I'm not sure that we know. These tend to come later, don't they? So hot flushes often start when women are still having their periods. Um, in the mid-50s, perhaps, we are seeing women who are, who are talking about um, their uncomfortable vagina or recurrent urinary tract infections. These women, of course, can use vaginal estrogen. So before I go on to talk about hormone therapy, oral or transdermal, vaginal estrogen can be used long term. We don't have worries about strokes and breast cancer or anything else. There's minimal systemic absorption. Um, 
It takes four to six weeks for the cream, or Vestin is the one that's funded, to, to work. So um, you use it every night for the first two or three weeks and then twice weekly thereafter. Um, and it is long term. Once the woman stops, four to six weeks later, um, her symptoms come back. And this is often a complaint from women. Um, they say, oh, I used that before and it didn't work. And they only kept going for two weeks. They didn't realize they'd have to wait a little bit longer. A little bit of word of advice here. If you have an older woman whom you're starting on vaginal estrogen, anything she puts in her vagina, because the skin is so atrophic, will sting. So get her to um, best to um, prescribe the cream and applicator as opposed to the pessaries. Get her to put a little tiny bit of cream in her finger and very, very, very slowly build up the dose because once her vaginal epithelium gets a little bit thicker, it won't sting anymore. So that's the way to kind of get, get it introduced. And just to remind you, we talk, we're talking about the genital urinary syndrome, just to remind you that oral estrogen causes urinary incontinence or makes it worse. I'm not quite sure why, I mean, why that exactly is the case, but this is from all the randomized placebo control studies. Um, vaginal estrogen makes it better, but oral estrogen can make incontinence worse. So oral estrogen may help your vaginal problem, but it's not going to help your urinary problems. And indeed, often oral estrogen doesn't really help the vagina enough. So women who have both hot flushes, using oral estrogen for that, and vaginal dryness may need the cream as well. You may get some improvement with mood, but that's mainly with women who are, have night sweats and poor sleep pattern. And of course, if they're sleeping better, um, they may feel much better during the day. Still very clear, we are not using hormones to prevent chronic disease. That hasn't changed for over a decade. You'll know these absolute risks. I'm not going to pay any much attention to these because these were the risks of the whole cohort of women in WHI. And it's much nicer just to, or much more useful for us to look at the risks for a woman that we are seeing with hot flashes who really want to know, okay, you're giving me this stuff, Helen, you know, what are the pluses and minuses? And you can see that for 10,000 women per year, these are the actual increases or decreases of these outcomes with combined therapy. They're different with estrogen-only therapy, so just these ones seem to be the, the main problem. Um, and you can see that if you look at the WHO classification for risk, these are all rare risks by WHO classification. And now we have 13 years of follow-up that came out a couple of years ago. So if you wanted to say to a woman, well, here's your risks while you're taking it, uh, and I can tell you the risk when you've stopped it, now we can do that. So clearly, two and a half years after the woman stops her hormone therapy, the VTE risk is gone, the stroke risk is gone. The breast cancer risk, though, for combined therapy is still there a bit. So let's look at that. So these are women, here were the studies. Combined therapy study lasted for six years, the estrogen only study lasted for seven years. Now we have seven to eight years of follow-up when the woman didn't use her hormone. So we have all this data um, 13 years later. So when you've been off your hormones for that length of time, what risks have you got left? So you've got the breast cancer risk is still there with combined therapy. This is per 10,000 women per year, so it didn't completely disappear. And here, an interesting thing is that these women who were in estrogen only seem to have less coronary heart disease. Minus 11 cases per 10,000 women per year. Hmm, that's sort of interesting. Let's have a wee more, a bit more of a look at that. Because You've got to remember that these women who are taking unopposed estrogen used it, used it for this particular time period, so we can't actually extra, extrapolate to other time periods of use. This is a really interesting, I should have bolded this, but this is a very interesting comment from the Eshri Capri workshop. The corresponding number needed to treat to prevent one coronary heart disease event in one year would be 1,000 women. So it's not something you're going to be using to see if you're going to make coronary heart disease better. Um, and indeed, we have some data, you know, why is that? Here's a study that looked at young women. Um, it was an RCT, it comp 
uh, compared oral transdermal estrogen with placebo, and there was no benefit using hormone therapy for the primary endpoint, which was carotid artery intima thickness. So that's not how it's uh, benefiting. Similarly, uh, we have data from that same study that there's no benefit for cognitive function. And this is a uh, Cochrane review from a few years ago. Uh, neither Eastern therapy or combined therapy um, prevent cognitive decline. Well, we do have some data now. Um, this is a fairly recent study in Maturitas showing us that with the large longitudinal studies that memory does decline during the menopausal transition. Yes. We all know that, I think, probably, but appears to rebound during the postmenopausal stage. Yay, isn't that fantastic? Um, so, hormone therapy should not be used for the sole purpose of improving memory. Uh, however, some women who are using it for their night sweats and so on may sleep better and feel they can function better the next day. Okay, so nothing has changed with funding for a while. Just remember the funded ones are Estradiol Valerate, ProGynova and MPA Provera, or if you want to choose Noraday, the progesterone-only pill, if you have a uterus, that will give you good endometrial protection. Let's look at the doses. Well, let's just look at the cost of the other ones for a minute or two. So if you're using the subsidized one, and the woman's got a uterus, you can give her Proganova and Provera, and it's going to be $5 each, i.e. $10 for three months' supply. Look at the cost of things like Premarin, Premarin is just as expensive as, as transdermal, for goodness sakes, for three months. So just for you to know that it is, for a lot of women, quite an expensive process if you don't actually um, prescribe the ones that are funded. It's a woman's choice. You can talk to her um, about whether cost is a concern. You actually can get away with quite low doses of hormones for some women. And our problem in New Zealand is that most of our packaged hormone therapies are medium doses, and women often don't need that higher dose. Um, and of course, the corresponding um, higher risks with it. So we do tend to individually prescribe. It's really easy. You have a wee look at this. This came from our Cochrane review. And we know that if you're using one milligram of estradiol valerate, ProGynova, if you're using sequential, i.e. the woman's less than one year um, postmenopause, You'll, this will give you good endometrial protection, this will give you good endometrial protection, both of these are funded. If you're using it continuously, i.e. more than one year postmenopause, this dose will give you good endometrial protection. So we mainly try to start with low doses um, and only work up at, th at the three-month visit if the woman feels she hasn't really got good relief from her flashes. We're clear about these women shouldn't use hormone therapy, these women shouldn't use estrogen, these women shouldn't use progesterone, these women shouldn't use tibolone. We'll look at what they could use in a minute or two. These women could use progesterone, though. You know, these women could use a, a progesterone-only pill in the same way they could use progesterone for their flashes. So we have reasonably good RCT data that 10 milligrams or 20 milligrams of oral Provera can help flashes better than placebo. So you could use that with these women daily. And we won't talk about these areas. I think these areas, some of these women can use hormone therapy. It really depends on the type of cancers they've had. And these are the sort of ones that you can refer to my clinic at Green Lane for further discussion. Or indeed, email me if you want. So we talked a little bit about what we do with those older women. I think that's the biggest difficulty, isn't it? Um, getting into their 60s just cannot get off their hormone therapy because every time they do, they just seem to have still got these debilitating flushes. Do we have a modalities of giving hormone therapy that are safer? Well, we do. And this is all from observational data, but there's quite a lot of um, observational data now coming together. And we can see that we don't seem to have the increased risk in VTE with transdermal estrogen. That was either the 50 patch or the 25 patch, but not the 100 patch. These women, if they, were u if they had a uterus and needed progesterone, the progesterone, in fact, the progesterone used in the studies happened to be uterogestin which is micronized oral progesterone, which you can prescribe, which costs a bit much. So both of these are going to cost a bit 
a bit more. They're not subsidised, but you're going to actually get um, that benefit from the point of view of the VTE risk, and also you're going to get the same no increased risk of stroke. So that's good news for those older women, isn't it? Um, you can say if you change this modality now, if you really have to keep going your hormone therapy, this is a safer way to take it. It's not funded, but you've got to weigh that against um, continuing with oral. And of course, uh, using a Mirena may be beneficial. We don't have any data, but one assumes that if you're having a less dose of systemic progestogen, levonorgestrel, you may have less risks um, with a Mirena. And the other interesting thing, and again, it's just coming from um, observational studies. This is the French cohort study. It does look as if different progestogens. So, you know, when you looked at those absolute risks, Estrogen plus progesterone increases the risk of breast cancer. Estrogen alone doesn't seem to do it. There's something about the addition of progesterone that confers that risk. But progesterone seem to be different. And here we are again, eutrogestin. Um, this is progesterone, natu or oral micronized natural progesterone, which is eutrogestin, which we, we can prescribe here. This seems to not have the same breast cancer risk when added to estrogen as using other progestins or MPA or um, norethestrone. So that's another reason perhaps for a woman as they get older changing to transdermal and oral micronized natural progesterone, eutrogestin. So are there things that you can try for women with breast cancer? Yes, there's um, our RCT data that your antidepressants may be useful, that clonidine may be useful, and the most useful thing, i.e. coming near hormone therapy, is gabapentin. Um, none of them are funded for um, flushes. Nupentin is probably the, the cheapest um, gabapentin that you can get. Good to start slowly, good to start with 300 milligrams at night and work up to one three times a day, which showed benefit in the study. So I have to say that some women find just the one 300 milligram at night um, adequate for flush relief. And if the woman's on tamoxifen, you don't want to be using these uh, SRIs because it can interfere um, with uh, the cyclone P450 and how tamoxifen works, so you would use these two um, SRIs for these particular women. And uh, vaginally, what should we do for a woman with previous breast cancer? Yes, quite good to try Replens first. It's a specific vaginal moisturizer. RCT data show that it works not quite as well as vaginal estrogen. So it's not just a lubricant, it's a moisturizer you're going to use continuously in the same way as vaginal estrogen. But if that doesn't work, I think there's fairly good um, agreement that you can use a Vestin. Not Vagifem. Vagifem is 17 beta estradiol and it has a little bit more absorption, but a Vestin and estriol um, can be used for women who have previous breast cancer because there's such minimal absorption. These are the pamphlets I think are useful. I've updated this one before I left family planning. You can get it from their website. It's got those absolute risks for women aged 50 to 59 in, in them. So kind of easy to kind of say, well, these are your risks and, you know, give it to them to take away. This is a very nice pamphlet that Margaret Hickey put together in Melbourne for a woman with previous breast cancer and covers what they can use for flushes, but a lot of other areas of sexuality as well. And you can download it from that rather complicating looking URL. So we can use estrogen for hot flushes, starting at low doses. We can use uh, progesterone on its own for hot flushes. Uh, we can use clonidine, we can use the antidepressants in these sort of doses, um, and we can use gabapentin that we've discussed um, just a few moments ago. Now that's, I've come to the end there. There's a few other bits and pieces that I have here, and I don't know whether to go on and talk about them or whether we should stop now and have some questions. Um, the other bits and pieces are some more detailed uh, what sorts of, which particular cancers you should not use hormone therapy with, uh, ovarian cancers or endometrial cancers, and a little bit of the uh, five or six slides on premature ovarian insufficiency, or maybe seven or eight slides. 
What would you like me to do? Shall we stop and take questions now for the next 10 minutes, or shall I plow on regardless? Plow on regardless, OK. What would you like me to plow on with? Do you want uh, details of various cancers not to use hormones with, or would you like to go into premature ovarian insufficiency? I don't think I can do both. Am I hearing POI, premature ovarian insufficiency? Is that what you want? Okay. I'm not going to do any of that. Ah, here we go. Okay. So, premature ovarian insufficiency is, of course, period stopping before the age of 40. And, and the sort of testing that you're going to do, uh, you can start off doing this yourself if you've, um, before you refer, if you think you need to refer, is you're going to be looking, obviously, at a pregnancy test to make sure that the woman isn't pregnant. You're going to be doing FSHs and Easter dials a few times. You're going to be doing a karyotype analysis to make sure there isn't something abnormal there, like Turner's. And you're going to be doing autoantibodies just to make sure that the other things like thyroid, there isn't an autoimmune disease going on um, in other areas other than the ovary. The causes are these, but, you know, really the majority, we don't seem to find a cause for at all. The important thing, I think, to discuss with women, particularly for those women who have not had a family, is there's a very small chance of spontaneous remission. I'm going to talk about whether we should use hormone therapy for these women, but if, if you've got a woman who is really hoping out for that small chance that her ovaries might wake up again and she might get pregnant, these women should have hormone therapy to actually make sure that your, their uterus is going to be receptive. But let's look a wee bit of the data about POI. Here is the Canadian um, guidelines, and the Canadian guidelines are one of the few guidelines that actually give us some evidence levels for the statements they make, which I think is absolutely fantastic. And this is a real mess, but look at the red bits. You can see that for premature ovarian insufficiency, offer hormone therapy, yes, because the majority of these women have hot flushes that are quite, really quite debilitating, so they need it for symptom control. But I see a lot of women in my clinic at Green Lane, I guess they get sent to me, um, because people are wondering what to do, who have no symptoms. They manage to have um, early ovarian failure and they have no hot flushes and no night sweats and they're grand, thanks very much. Recommended use to natural age of menopause, level 3B evidence. Not one single randomized study. So that's the opinion of authorities based on clinical experience, um, expert opinion. So let's look at why it's level 3B. Here's just a few comments from other people who do a lot of menopause stuff. Martha Hickey, guidelines recommend evidence, uh, opinion of experts using hormone therapy until the normal age of menopause with POI, though there is little evidence on which to base this advice. It remains unclear. Here's a really, this is a really nice review that just came out last year from Sue Davis, another Australian. A low observational data shows an association with reduced risk of breast and ovarian cancer and an increased risk of heart disease and osteoporosis. There may not be a causal effect. These associations could result from common risk factors. Oh, okay. This is the WHI observational study. Okay, so when WHI started the study, there was a whole pile of women who wanted to join it, and they said, yep, you can join it. I see you're on hormone therapy. You'll have to do a three-month washout, and then we'll randomize you, and you might get hormone therapy back again, but you might get placebo. Well, a whole lot of women said, oh, I don't want to be in that study, thank you. I'm not giving up my, my hormones. And they went into the observational study, and they followed 90,000 women for five years. And the really interesting thing was here, Mortality and fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular disease was higher amongst women who had had a hysterectomy, a hysterectomy with one ovary taken out, or a hysterectomy with bilateral sphincter So it was hysterectomy, nothing to do with the ovaries, that was a significant predictor of cardiovascular disease. There's something about women who've had a hysterectomy, uh, some genetic thing or something else going on that may mean that these women are also a risk of high cardiovascular disease, not the fact that somebody took both ovaries out. What do these um, authors say? 
Cardiovascular risk may be due to the more adverse initial risk profile of women who have undergone hysterectomy. This analysis, this is probably the first to have sufficient power with extensive data collection as to the evidence against the hypothesis that changes in exposure to endogenous sex hormones or menopausal status influence the risk of cardiovascular disease amongst premenopausal women. Okay. So, say there was an increased risk. If we gave hormones, you know, we're telling women to use this stuff the next 20 years or whatever. Um, if we gave hormones, would it make that risk better? As I say, there's no randomized study. That's why it's level 3B uh, evidence. But, and all the observational studies, now props won't go through all these studies one by one, but all of the observational studies that suggest an improvement in cardiovascular disease, disease the confidence intervals cross one. The results were not statistically significant. That study, that study. Here we have... Just this year, European Journal of Preventive Cardiology. So they looked at all of the studies that suggested that women who had early menopause, premature ovarian insufficiency, and, what, and, and cardiovascular disease. And they actually thought there was a little bit of suggestion that maybe it was a modifier of cardiovascular risk classification, but they were saying, Nothing about using hormones, it was very minor, but women and the woman with POI and the physician should aim for optimal cardiovascular health in which a healthy lifestyle is the cornerstone of advice. What about bone then? You know, people are saying, for goodness sakes, you, know, you, you have your ovaries taken out for endometriosis or your, your POI at the age of 38 and your bones will be awful by the time you get to 50. Let's remember that we are not preventing osteoporosis. We are preventing clinical fracture. So that if you go into FRAX, you can Google FRAX, and you have a 50-year-old woman whose T-score is minus 2.5 and has no other risk factors, FRAX will just tell you to uh, normal lifestyle advice. That woman at age 50 has such a small risk of a hip fracture, even though she has osteoporosis, that they don't recommend treatment yet. Here is some really nice uh, commentary from a study looking at older women. And these older women, they were now over the age of 65 years, there were 6,500 of them. The fracture rate for these women who had premature ovarian insufficiency was not increased even among women who had never used hormone therapy. Conclusion, these data provide some assurance that long-term risk of non-vertebral fracture and vertebral fracture is not increased for postmenopausal women who had previous bilateral oophorectomy compared to women with intact ovaries, even in the absence of postmenopausal hormone therapy. And let's remember, you know, if we go back to the data from the Women's Health Initiative study, you know, when the study, yes, you get some benefit for fracture when you're on your hormone therapy, but um, two and a half years, 2.4 years after you stop your hormone therapy, any benefit for bone had gone already. And there's various other studies, I mean, I, I don't know if we need to go into them in depth, but there's various other studies that support this. The Large Nurses Health Study showed that there was no difference in hip fracture, even for those women who didn't take hormone therapy after POI. Um, and the Women's Health Observational Study that we've talked about already that didn't show any, that showed that that uh, cardiovascular increase was associated with hysterectomy and not with the loss of ovaries, also showed that uh, the woman who never used hormone therapy didn't have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease or hip fracture or mortality. So I, what am I saying? I, I'm not saying don't offer a woman who has got PI hormone therapy. Um, often they'll have severe symptoms and they're the very woman that will need it for their symptoms. They often have much severe hot flushes and night sweats. But I'm saying that if they don't have symptoms and they don't want to have that small hope of being pregnant again, you're going to have to work very hard to explain to that woman why you're treating her with hormones for the next 10 or 15 years. There's no reason why you shouldn't, but I'm not quite sure how we explain it to women. That's it. Okay, thank you very much.
Probably got a couple of minutes, maybe. No, I will see if there's a couple of questions. Any questions? Yes. Here. Um, in women that are using a marina postmenopausally, are they are their risks the same as using just oestrogen alone, or are they oestrogen and progesterone risks for breast cancer and um, the cardiovascular risks? Yeah. So um, let's remember we don't have any randomised data to tell us. But as I said, because the dose of systemic levonorgestrel with the Mirena is something like a quarter of a POP's worth, so because there's less progesterone systemically, one would assume that the risks for that woman were more like estrogen only than combined therapy. But I don't have the randomised evidence to tell it, but one is assuming that prob probably is the answer. Mm. Just waiting for the mic. Sorry. Is there any alternative medication uh, uh, for menopause other than hormone replacement therapy? Sorry, I didn't get the first bit. Is there any what? Alternate uh, therapies, uh, complementary therapies rather than hormone replacement. Okay. Um, so you're not talking about SSRIs, you're not talking about clonidine, you're not talking about gabapentin, you're talking about CAM therapies, complementary and alternative medicine therapies, and really the only thing that we have is black cohosh. We had a recent Cochrane review um, that thought, systematic review, that really came to the conclusion that it wasn't useful, but there are some more studies suggesting there may be some use with using black cohosh or remifemin for flushes over placebo. And that's the only thing at the moment that I'm aware of that's on the market, complementary wise. Um, Helen, can I just double check? Did you say if we're starting anyone on a combined oral contraceptive pill now, we tell them to take it um, continuously? No, you give them the choice. <laughs> but I'm just saying there's a really big, two couple of really big reasons for using it continuously. One, you don't have a period. I mean, who wants to have a period? Uh, though the guy who invented the pill obviously thought we all did want to have a period, but never mind. Um, and the other thing is you get much better contraception with it. Um, so that's two pluses. So I, I usually give women the choice. I think their concern is that there's going to be all this endometrium building up, or it's not good for them not to have a period. And once you explain that the endometrium just is thin and sits there for the next 10 years if they took it continuously, I think that's really reassuring. And once you explain, particularly for those women at Epsom Day, you know, who had a an unintended pregnancy on the pill, once they know that they're going to get better contraception, I think that's a big plus for them. Mm. Oh, you're only giving them for them to have periods um, to protect the endometrium because PCOS has, is estrogen dominant and because of that, you have a slightly increased risk of endometrial cancer. You're giving the progestion continuously so it's even better than having a break. It doesn't have to come away. It's just sitting there. Um, I just wanted to ask you for contraindications for hormone replacement therapy in women who've had previous receptor negative breast cancer. I still, I think um, there are various types of. I think the advice now is quite, you're quite right, is to actually look at receptor positivity. Um, with breast cancer, as opposed to some types of ovarian cancer, with breast cancer, I think current wisdom is, even if it's receptor negative, not to use hormones at this time. There are various sorts of ovarian serous cancers that you can look at receptors and perhaps jiggle and decide on hormone therapy, but I think it's just no for breast cancer, whether it's negative or positive. Okay, are we? Satisfied and, and thank you very much, Helen. That's really